Hello, listeners. Welcome to The Bible Never Said That. On this podcast, we talk about popular sayings that have permeated the culture and church, even though they're theologically twisted. My name is Shara Donahue, and today we are exploring the saying, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Now, this statement is motivational, and the go getter attitude, it's inspiring. However, rest is a spiritual necessity that too many people neglect. We must make room for Sabbath rest. But before we get into the spiritual discipline of keeping Sabbath, I have a confession to make. So, a case could be made for the Bible saying, I'll sleep when I'm dead. But, so not as our culture uses it. However, sometimes in the Bible, death is referred to as sleep. In 1 Corinthians 15.6, Paul, after talking about the awesomeness that was the resurrection, says, After that, he, meaning Jesus, appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And Psalm 13.3 says, Look on me and answer, Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. I mean, I'm sorry. I will sleep in death is pretty close to I'll sleep when I'm dead. But the meaning of each of these is different. The way the Bible uses it is not the way our culture wears I'll sleep when I'm dead as a badge of productivity and efficiency, two attributes greatly praised by our society. So, the Bible may literally say, I will sleep in death, but it does not agree with the culture's nuanced restlessness of, I'll sleep when I'm dead. We must learn to know the bias of our cultures and to discern if what they are preaching actually lines up with what God has to say or if it is a distortion. You may hear, I'll sleep when I'm dead, come from the lips of someone out partying too late. Or maybe a workaholic says it to themselves when they are the last one in the office. Or what about the person in the church who works in ministry but is headed towards burnout? Can I tell you how much I love sleep? A little too much, which is also a problem that we will get to. But let's talk about sleep in general first. Sleep deprivation is used as a form of torture, so why do we do it to ourselves so often? My husband recently showed me a video on how to train yourself to sleep less, to have a polyphysic sleep cycle where one would sleep about four hours and then take a couple of naps during the day. Needless to say, I had no interest in this bombastic irrationality. But this is the thing, people. People are trying to train themselves to sleep less so they can do more, but it doesn't mean they'll do more well. We are called to be good stewards of the bodies we have been given. Though they are temporary, they are a part of who we are and part of God's plan for our life. When Paul instructs the Corinthians about refraining from sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20, He reminds them, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. We should steward our bodies well. They are temporary, but they are a gift. You cannot function to your greatest capability if you are sleep-deprived. The love of God offers peace and rest. And we are told in Psalm 127 too, In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he, God, grants sleep to those he loves. In the notes, I'll link to a fascinating article about the sleeping habits of some historical figures, but I want to juxtapose two of these stories that I found so fascinating. Elizabeth London reported that Nikola Tesla survived off of one and a half to two hours of sleep 
from about midnight to 2 a.m. Listen, if those were my sleeping habits, I would not be a good light to this world. The appeal that would be made by my life would not be come to Jesus who knows you and loves you and has offered you forgiveness for everything you've ever done, everything you will do. But instead, I would be a cautionary tale for why people should get more sleep. Now, Mr. Tesla did eventually have a mental and emotional breakdown at the age of 25, but he did still recover and he kept inventing until his late 80s, even though he slept very little. However, he made a lot of poor choices when it came to business, and I do wonder what a couple more hours of sleep could have done for him and his world-class mind. Personally, I much prefer the ways of Winston Churchill, who slept until at least 8 a.m. and took non-negotiable naps. He worked into the night, but at least he kept well-rested. And good thing since he was leading Britain through World War II. Now, Time Magazine reported in 2017 that there are far more people who would like to need less sleep than those who actually need less sleep. Dr. Daniel Busset, professor of psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh and the past president of American Academy of Sleep Medicine, though the amount of sleep a person needs each night depends on their age and physical activity, most healthy adults should get between seven and nine hours each night. Time also said many don't hit that target. About one-third of Americans get less than seven hours of sleep a night, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Sleep is vital for the brain and the body to function at their best. And when a person doesn't get enough of it, their brain can't repair or build new pathways, Busset says. That makes it more difficult to retain information, engage in complex thinking, and stay focused. Sleep deficiency has also been linked to physical health problems such as obesity, high blood pressure, and heart disease. The majority of us should be sleeping more so we don't die early. We need not taunt death because we think we can live without sleep. One of the ways we honor God is with our bodies, and our bodies will not operate to their full potential on a consistent lack of sleep. I'm not saying it's a sin to miss a couple hours here and there, but we do need to pay attention to what we do with our bodies, what we put in them, and how much rest we give them. There is only one who need not sleep, and that is God. Which is just another reminder, he is God and we are not. When we close our eyes to the world, his eyes still see us. Psalm 121, 2-4 says, My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Now, even though God the Father didn't need sleep, when Jesus walked the earth, he was both fully man and fully God. And so he slept. Jesus was absolutely purposeful with how he spent his time. He was not idle, and he did everything God asked him to do. But even Jesus had people who tried to interrupt his sleep with what they thought was more important. In Mark 4, 38-40, we see the disciples freaking out because they are in a storm. The scriptures say, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? It gives me some encouragement to know that Jesus was woken from sleep as well. My babies have grown out of the eating in the middle of the night phase, or if they haven't, they are old enough to make their own food and I know nothing of it. They have stopped waking me from sleep, but the world these days is in a constant state of urgency. Work, managing a household, life, it can all make a soul weary, but the call of Jesus is one of rest. Matthew 11.28 isn't just for cute home decor. It is a powerful truth. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, 
and I will give you rest. What relief there is in the simplicity and succinctness of this verse. It meets me in my tired and tapped out places and reminds me that Jesus is not a slave driver. He is a refuge and there is no true rest away from him. The voices from the competing sources are drowned out when we bask in the truth that we are welcome with all we are to enter Jesus' comforting care. We first hear of the idea of rest from work in Genesis, when the all-powerful, never-tiring, God who never sleeps takes a day of rest. Genesis 2, 2-3 says, By the seventh day God had finished the work He had been doing. So on the seventh day He rested from all His work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it He rested from all the work of creating that He had done. I love this so much. If God gets to rest, I don't have to feel guilty about resting myself. If I've worked hard and have done what God has asked me to do, it isn't just okay to establish rhythms of rest. It's a holy practice. But rhythms of rest don't necessarily mean keeping the Sabbath in the ways that the Jewish people did. Moses is given the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. In verses 8 through 11, we see them talk about keeping the Sabbath. It is the fourth on the list and has one of the longest explanations. It says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Betsy de Cruz says that the word Sabbath is related to a Hebrew root that means cease or stop. God commanded his people to cease from their labor so they could rest, refresh, and refuel. He had set his people free from slavery in Egypt as children of God. They were no longer bound to work nonstop like slaves. God gave them the gift of rest, a day to cease from working and to honor him. In the Old Testament, Jews followed the pattern of setting apart the seventh day to keep it holy. There are over 600 laws in the Old Testament, and some were very specific to the Jewish people at that time. Not all of those laws pertain to us today, so we look for reinforcement of what is to be followed in the New Testament. And most of the Ten Commandments show up quite clearly, except this one. Now, Jesus did practice the Sabbath when he was here on earth, but that was also before the cross, before the new covenant was completed and made. Though there are a group of Christians who choose to observe the Sabbath on Saturday or Sunday, we are not commanded to keep Sabbath on one of those days. In Romans 14, Paul addresses that some of the Jewish Christians were unwilling to give up certain practices that they were bound to in the Old Covenant. Things like circumcision, and if you want to know more about what a big deal this was, check out the drama happening over in Galatians. Dietary restrictions, and yes, the Sabbath. What we are told is that we shouldn't be judgy of how others do or do not practice the Sabbath. In verse 4 and 5, Paul says clearly, Who are you to judge someone else's servant? Because we're all God's servants. To their own master, he continues, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord. For they give thanks to God, and whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. The pattern of the Old Testament sets the principles for the New Testament, including rest. Notice that the reasoning Paul provides is not arguing for making everything less holy when comparing the two. For one, it's a day that stands out as holy and set apart and sacred. The other considers all days alike. 
meaning they are all holy. The verses that follow confirm this. Whether days or food or abstinence, it is to the Lord. So the purpose of this rest is to the Lord, giving the day over to God in such a way that it then makes you more energized and ready to serve and work diligently the other six days. And yes, even though many have been acculturated to the two-day weekend, and some even arrange their schedules for a three- or more-day weekend, the biblical pattern set by God in Genesis is six days of work and a day of Sabbath rest given to God in a way which puts Him at the center of your life. This idea of freedom from human rules is further discussed in Colossians 2, 13-17, where we see Paul say, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. I so love how the Word of God slices right through all our reasoning and self-focused ideas and gets to the heart. The way we rest may be tied to keeping the Sabbath, and it may not be, but whatever we do, may it be to give thanks to the Lord. This brings me to rest as a spiritual discipline. When we think of spiritual disciplines, we often think of prayer, reading our Bibles, or serving in the church. But practicing rest is a worthwhile practice as well. Remember, this is something that God did. Though the Sabbath practice may have been a sign of the Old Covenant, taking a day of rest is a way for us to let go of the control we so desperately cling to. It's a way for us to physically act out our trust that God's got this. Remember, God modeled the rhythm. A time set apart to worship God and be with His people is worthwhile even if it does not push our own agendas forward. Rest focuses us. It's a practice of yielding to God. A practice of remembering who He is and what He has done. And we have to keep in mind that though we may practice keeping Sabbath differently, Sabbath is also just a shadow of the rest that is found in Christ alone. So how do we take the time to breathe in the peace of God in the midst of this noisy world we live in? A quick side note, though, before we dig into some scriptures that will help quiet our souls. We live in a day of false rest. We think rest and we run to the couch in our favorite streaming service. But we cannot believe the lie that being comfortable equals comfort. Self-care is important as long as it is motivated by being a good steward of our body and doesn't morph into self-worship. We often settle for being comfortable rather than seeking God's comfort. When we do this, we begin to circumvent the true purpose of rest by settling for being pacified. Life feels heavy, so we escape into the status updates of others, play online matching or popping games, and binge on our latest favorite TV show instead of spending time with our Savior. Then, as we rest our head on our pillow at night, the mind awakens and the heart still aches because I'll get to time with God later never came to be. The tech boom has brought about a new form of the old truth in Romans one twenty five. They exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the Creator. The Creator is the only one who can actually deliver soul-satisfying comfort. Being comfortable is never as good as the presence of the one who is able to comfort our hearts in all seasons of life. True self-care equals resting in His care. Finding real rest isn't always easy, either. And so I don't want to leave you with telling you to rest, 
but not giving you any tools that would help you do so. I know for me, when I seek to escape into muted moments, the chaotic racket of my life feels like a monster lurking ominously in the shadows. I hear its breathing while the increasing hunger I have to connect with God growls within me. To-do lists loom, notifications whip out onto screens with a snap, and the world tells me, do more, be more, give more, 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 more. The loudness of expectation from a world begging for me to listen to the seductive songs of leisure and mediocrity has threatened to leave my nerves strung out and dry. And idleness sometimes seems like an oasis in the never-ending desert of this productivity, but it does not produce the refreshment that the true rest we have been talking about can bring. It does not bring life. But then the loneliness kicks in. I feel isolated, withering away on the demands of everyone and everything, except the one I long to serve most, my Lord and my God. It is only in His presence that I can hear my soul delicately whisper, Shh, I'm listening for the words of my Master. The only antidote I have found to the barrage of solicitation and thirst for more is the familiar cushion of truth found in the scriptures. So we're going to go to a couple passages that help to calm the chaos. And this first one was relevant when it was written, and it is relevant now. So let's look at Psalm 46, 9 through 11. It says, He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He, God, breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. We don't always think of peace when we think of sitting in a fortress. But what this passage reminds our battle-weary thoughts is that God is the ultimate maker of peace. While rumors of wars accost our eyes as we scroll through news feeds, God is not to be forgotten. He is to be known. He is mighty and strong, just and merciful, and He is the one who was, is, and always will be. He will be exalted, and because of Him, our souls can find peace. And finally, a passage that gives us a beautiful example of how to practice rest. Luke 10, 38-42 As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or, indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. This is the perfect remedy for the overstimulated soul. In the midst of the clatter that arises from within and around us, it honestly directs us to where to find the truest peace, power, and purpose at the feet of our Jesus. Sometimes when we seek rest, we need to imagine ourselves as just a learner coming to the Savior and sitting at His feet to listen and lean in. Life is a gift and we can enjoy it, but we cannot run ourselves so ragged that we don't take time to remember God and care for the body He has given us. We get glimpses of the soul rest offered this side of heaven. But there is a day that is coming in which we can look forward to entering Jesus' rest completely. Will you pray with me to find the quiet? Jesus, thank you that you call us to rest, that even when the world is noisy, You can quiet the storms that rage within us. 
Help us to know how to care for our bodies in a way that honors you. Help us to worship you alone and not to bow to the demands of a world that forgets your majesty. Thank you for modeling rest for us and help us to discover what it truly means. And it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for listening today and taking a moment to rest in the scriptures with us. The resources, books, and articles referred to can be found in the show notes at crosswalk.com slash podcast or on iTunes. And if you're over in the notes, we'd love if you would rate and review this podcast so others can find us. And until next time, may you seek the abundant life that Jesus died to give and live in the truth that sets people free. Thank you.